Today on the Rob Dibble Show, Vegas Knights captain Mark Stone picks up a hat trick on the night they wrap up the quest for Lord Stanley's Cup. Mark Stone with the Golden Knights short handed, drawn by Stevenson. Stone waits. These are my best friends. These are the guys I I spend every day with, and uh, it's just, just celebrating with these guys is unbelievable. Got that now, from the surprisingly comfortable studios of 10 Columbus Boulevard, here's Rob Dibble. I don't know. I think they're partially air-conditioned today. It's hot in here, man. What are you talking about? It was cooler before when I made this. <laughs> yeah. It's getting hotter because it's the afternoon. We're just kidding. Uh, Rob Dibble Show, Adam Giardino still in for Ben Darnell. 9-3 is your final. Stone Marcus, he has been your captain since they started the franchise. And what is he, about 37 years old now? He's kind of old. He's an older player, but uh, yeah, kudos to him. Hat trick. 9-3 is your final. Four in the second period sealed the deal. Uh, six to one was uh, after two periods. That's when I literally turned it off, and I was like, okay, yeah. these guys, they should have this, especially with the way Hill has been playing in goal. But, I mean, some of the little things that I look at, uh, the Knights, they, they won 37 out of 30 face-offs. Those are big. Would you agree with that, Kurt? that you're constantly getting these face-offs and even even in, on power plays and things like that, uh, getting that shorthanded goal by Stone to start things off, I thought it was an amazing move. How rare it is a guy stops right in front of the goal and then pops it, it in. has the presence of mind to be that patient. That is a hard thing to do. You want to put that thing home right away. That's right. <laughs> or pa- try to pass it to the open guy on the other uh, other side of the goal, and he just he put it home himself, and that's what started. I mean, that, you know, 2 nothing after the first period, and you're you're going in there, and you're Paul Maurice. You're like, oh my God! Now we're in this crazy building. We're already, you know, fighting for our lives. It's elimination. Um, and then Vegas comes back out. You get a goal, but they get four, and they pretty much seal the deal. Yeah, I mean, once it got to two one early in that second period, you thought, okay, we've got a game on our hands. But I, I don't, I don't even know what that second intermission pep talk could have been in the Panthers locker room. I don't even know what you say when you're down six one on the road. And you've got 20 minutes, and you know you've got to score at least five goals. I don't know what you say. Broken sternum is what Matthew Kachuk has. So they, I thought it was a lower body injury. It was not. It was an upper body injury. Broken sternum, if you don't know, that's your chest bone, chest plate that covers your heart and keeps all your organs in. Um, that's something you can't mess with, even even if you're a stud uh, like Matthew Kachuk. But they just look disjointed all night. Like, even on the power play, which is is one of the big things for Kachuk, um, you know, when you get power plays in the postseason, you really... Exactly. You you need to, you know, have a, a much better chance. And just that first goal, I think, that just had to suck the oxygen out of their locker room. Yeah. There was... There was nothing that went Florida's way. No. Even when you say, oh, yeah, they got it to a 2-1 game in the second period. I know in hindsight, we know the final was 9-3. So you say, okay, yeah, the game was never right. close. It was close early in the second period, and it stayed a one-goal game until the midway point of the game. It was halfway through the second period. It was still a 2-1 game. But even for those eight minutes, Florida never looked like they were about to. It just never felt like they were about to even it up, go on a run, take the lead. And then once Vegas... You know, scored, made it 3-1, 10 and a half minutes in, just about 90 seconds later, added another tally, and from there it was over. Shots were pretty close, 35-32. Hits were close, 27 both times for both teams. Um, but this is the thing that I always look at, block shots, 26-12 to by the Vegas Knights. These guys put their bodies on the line uh, to win the championship. Very much deserving, and so... Uh, you know, franchise that's only been around a very short time. It's funny to see the Nuggets go 47 years. And how long has this team been around? For like seven years, eight years? Yeah. Um, so, you know, but, but, but still, Vegas has done everything right. 
They 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 have gotten the best players. I mean, even Jonathan Quick, who is a Connecticut native, um, he just got his third Stanley Cup being on on the bench with these guys. You know, you're trying to get the best goaltenders. You're trying to get the best defensemen. You're trying to get the best guys that can win uh, playoffs and things like that. Jack Eichel had three assists last night. You know, th- this is a guy that, that we talked about the preemptive neck surgery uh, to make sure that he was prepared to, to have a long career. Um, and his first team didn't think so. And ended up trading him. So I, I just think that teams look for certain types of players. And I think the one thing I've learned from general managers the last 25 years, we also want to uh, litter our locker room with guys that are champions. Guys that have experience winning cups. Guys that have experience being fighting for cups in the postseason. And I think the Vegas Golden Knights uh, had plenty of those guys all around, including their, you know, Butch Cassidy. This is a guy, you know, we got to talk about that guy too. He was let go by the Boston Bruins. Uh, great run with the Boston Bruins. Everybody knows he's a great head coach, and I'm sure that they, they were happy to add him to the, to the, the to the lineup. You know, he's not a player, but he's certainly a guy that's going to motivate the players that they already had in house. Yeah, and they absolutely did that. And I want to circle back to what you said about uh, Jonathan Quick, where he started the season with the L.A. Kings. I mean, yeah. this is that's the team that he played for his entire career and went into a situation with Vegas. He, he was traded from the Kings to the Blue Jackets, never played for the Blue Jackets. Yep. A day later, was traded uh, officially to Vegas. And uh, at, at that stage of your career, guys will obviously say, yeah, I want to go win another cup. And he was able to do that, but he did it in a reserve role. Right. He did start nine games for Vegas during the regular season, had a three goals against average, totally fine performance there. Um, but... It, it had to be some sort of mixed emotions, right? I mean, you you are a guy that from age 22 until age 37, the only thing you know is playing for the Los Angeles Kings. You've won multiple individual awards. You've won multiple Stanley Cup titles with this team. And so in early March to be traded, uh, obviously an opportunity to go out and win a cup, but it certainly has to be weird. And I, I don't think it particularly mattered from him, for him as he was one of the first guys to lift the cup and take it on the the celebratory lap around the ice after last night's victory. So really cool moment for, like you said, Connecticut native, UMass product, local kid, and just continues to grow his legacy, which frankly might have Hall of Fame written on. There's there's an opportunity there to make that case. A guy that has a career two and a half goals against average. He's got over 375 wins in the regular season. There are a lot of numbers there for Jonathan Quick. Milford, Connecticut product, that Hamden, Connecticut product that will uh, make him definitely one of the better goalies of a generation. Jack Eichel led everybody in scoring uh, for this team with 26 points, uh, six goals, 20 assists. Um, You know, this kid's out of Massachusetts as well. So it's nice to have kids from the East Coast uh, that are representing in the Stanley Cup. And, And it just shows you, um, you know, Canada hasn't had a Stanley Cup champ since, what, 93? Yeah. And it's it's just it it boggles I mean, your it's mind. Been 31 yeah. years. It'll be 31 seasons. Exactly. So when you when you're thinking about how dominant uh hockey is and 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 above, you know, north of our border, um it, it's just it I think it's amazing that uh we continue not to dominate, but the fact that we're in there at, at the end of a lot of these seasons is pretty cool. I thought one of the more interesting tweets that I saw in the aftermath came very early this morning. It was at Mike Gould, and he said that the Oilers, Edmonton Oilers, selected first overall in the NHL draft in 2010, 11, 12, and 15. Those four players have not won a Stanley Cup with the Edmonton Oilers. The four players who were taken second in those four drafts have all won the Stanley Cup, oh. Tyler Sagan with Boston in 2010. That was the draft pick. Gabe Landeskog in 2011, Ryan Murray in 2012. They both won it with Colorado, and now Jack Eichel doing it not with the team that he was drafted by in 2015, the Buffalo Sabres, but doing it eight years later with the Vegas Golden Knights. Well, good for him. Good And good yeah. for all of these guys. Listen, it's it, a lot of it is about team. A lot of it's about timing, being in the right place at the right time. That's why we brought up Jonathan Quick. Uh, you get veteran guys. Um, you look at the Pittsburgh Pirates in baseball right now. You look at the Arizona Diamondbacks. Uh, you know, Gurriel Jr. is on that team. You know, uh, you, you've got um, Andrew um, McCutcheon is on the Pirates. They yeah. brought him back because you need leadership. You look at the Boston Celtics and you bring back Al Horford. You need 
Uh, almost uh, you need examples. You need guys that can set the example, not for the younger players so much, but for preparing for the game. And I think a lot of these guys, when you start looking at the older players and you're like, oh, that's why that guy's played 15 years. I mean, that's the way I looked at when I came up to the major leagues. I, I would settle in on the bench and, you know, some guys be goofing around and chewing tobacco and spitting seeds and stuff like that. And I chose to spend a lot of my time uh, being annoying and asking veterans questions and asking them things that could help my career. And I think if you're a smart young player, you do that. And if you're a smart organization, you bring in those veterans that want to teach. We hear it all the time where I'm not going to teach this guy anything like Barry Bonds is famous for saying and other players um, don't want to do that with quarterbacks in the NFL. Right, I don't want him to take my job right now. That's right, right now. And even Ben Roethlisberger just came out and said that, uh, you know, he didn't want the dude in, in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, to learn anything from me. I, he, he didn't want him to be. Now he, now that he's retired, now I want to be successful. Sure. So I, I just think that you have to have a mixture. I think great organizations or winning organizations realize that. Um, and it's not all about numbers. The analytics are great. But at the end of the day, sometimes it's somebody showing you uh, the ropes that helps you the most. Especially a guy like you said, Mark Stone. So he's 31 years old, but it's been an 11-year NHL career. He's like he's been career. around he, well, forever. Right, and it's an 11-year right. NHL career, I'm yeah. sure. Uh, some days he wakes up and he feels 51, not 31. And well, with set, the surgeries he's had, he probably feels 51 Two back today. surgeries in the last uh, year. And so in the regular season, and this is one of the guys you're talking about. I know we've highlighted Jonathan Quick and Jack Eichel, who is still in his 20s, even though he is more of that veteran leader type. Stone, 11-year NHL career, regular season, 17 goals. The fact that he had 11 goals in the postseason run which includes up his game. with a hat trick yeah. yesterday. I mean, you want to talk about uh, just a guy that can you imagine what the teammates are feeling for him in that locker room, spent seven years with the Ottawa Senators, mostly in anonymity, and now it has an opportunity to do what he did. And in a clinching performance, a clinching moment, able to get a hat trick. Yeah, sure. One of them was an empty net, but as you heard, one of them was a shorthanded goal, which was an incredible effort. So, I'll, I'll, I'll say that he earned that empty netter based on the first goal that he scored last night. Back-to-back -back losses and extras for the Red Sox. Yankees take it from the Mets with their best guy on the mound for the Mets, uh, Max Scherzer. Uh, I think they had a 5-1 to lead when I turned it on, and he gave it back, and uh, they took like a 6-5 to lead at the time. Um, yeah, put up a 5 spot. Seven to six is your final. I, I mean, it's it's tough to watch the Mets right now. The Mets are doing everything wrong. Um, even when they score a bunch of runs, then they get their ace, cannot hold the lead. Um, and that's unfortunate. So it's just they, they just seem to be um, in a funk. But you could tell 20 hits between the two teams. Um, they were both pumped for the Subway Series. They, they definitely wanted... Uh, you know, both teams wanted to make a good impression on this first game this year. And for Starling Marte, right? He was a guy that we talked about yesterday. Struggling. Yeah, but had, yep. you know, he, but even within what he was able to do, one for five, okay, yep. he gets on base once, but still second base. And just yep. as somebody that. Little things. Yeah. Leaders three, do. Three home runs this season, and that number has to change. He's slugging 330 this year. And, I mean, even for a guy that's not hitting home runs, his speed should be getting him doubles and triples. So something's off with Starling Marte. But one of those veteran leaders, you talk about leaders going to Pittsburgh. Well, this is a guy that came up with the Pittsburgh Pirates, and now he's providing some leadership for the New York Mets. And again, just in in a day where they needed something, he was able to deliver something, but they needed a little bit more down the stretch because they blew that early lead, and it just felt like from the moment the Yankees grabbed the 6-5 lead, winning 7-6, that the Mets just, they deflated. Their posture just wasn't what it needed to be to, to feel like, okay, we're at home. We still got this thing. It felt like Oh no! Woe is us, and that was the way that that thing finished. Dibs, Max, let me go ask ahead. you about the marketing of the series and the timing of putting this together. Knowing that you got the other two sports in their finals during this week, do you you take the biggest market and they put the two teams up against each other, and you kind of blow this opportunity, or could have even worse if the series were st still continuing past five games in each sport. I agree, but you you also have the Yankees going to Boston to play the Red Sox at the end of the week, so you still get another Well, they are, yeah, but that one's going to be, butt. they would have been over. Oh, yeah, the exactly. The game would have been over right. by then anyway. Right. But, but I agree with what you're saying. I mean, listen, Major League Baseball, they, they take their cues from the NFL. 
Um, they steal stuff probably from the NHL and the NBA, but they're terrible at marketing their game. Mm-hmm. You you don't know how good Acuna Jr. and and you know Corbin Carroll and so many of these other players are <clears throat> because they have no idea how to market them. But pace of play is, I think, the first step. I think oh, the yeah, fact listen. they've got this game under three hours now with consistency. I'm a I'm a baseball fan. Me, I am a baseball fan, and I am finally ready to sit down after not working in minor league baseball. Now this year, I'm finally ready to sit down and watch full games. But he nailed it. Why baseball is losing to the NFL and and the NBA? They market individuals. The this game is billed as the Subway Series between the Mets and the Yankees, and it's and to me, whenever we hear like even the, even what's been the headline for the last two days, Stephon Diggs. I mean, yeah. is he – Stephon Diggs is a, a great player <clears throat> on a great team, but he's not even on the Chiefs. We don't even know about the Chiefs. You know what I saw yesterday that nobody really saw? Kelsey threw out the first pitch at the Royals game. Okay, so, you know, and, and what was all over <clears throat> media today because the MLB will not show highlights on Twitter and social media. I got to see Donovan Mitchell throw – have Rick Patino throw to yep, him in correct. a game. Yep. So I, I get to see kind of the second or third tier of, of a story, and I don't see the home runs. I don't see the highlights. I don't see – like the NFL, you see highlights. You see camp. I see guys running through drills on every social media outlet. Major League Baseball has to get out of their own way and start marketing these individual things amazing catches things like those are things they should be popping out there like crazy like m&ms to kids you you got to start popping that stuff out there to the consumer so that they can bring that in and be like oh i gotta watch that guy play tonight in the, in the yankees met series not hey who's playing like we went over the lineups it was it was awful yeah well it's, it's awful it's hard it's hard because uh, honestly you want to highlight judge but he's injured you can't control that but really there's a lot of other stars that are out there growing up when we got cable in our house during the summer, 10 o'clock, I was watching baseball tonight. The fact that that does not exist right now right. hurts. It just does. It they're At 10 o'clock. Having done a, seven years on there, I, I understand that. I mean, web gems and just all of that, you, to get in, you can make baseball one of the most compelling sports in an hour. From 10 to 11, yep. show because there are 16 games, 15 games a night. And but what does ESPN hit you with? NFL, NFL NBA, and NBA all day. Yeah. You know, and LeBron. Then, yeah. LeBron, and, and they brought up LeBron yesterday yeah. after the freaking Nuggets win. I, I told you this when the <laughs> Nuggets were winning before. It's going to happen. And, and it's, it's all about LeBron all the time. Nobody cares. And, and most sports fans, they want to see their area. They want to see the highlights, even of their bad team. The Oakland Athletics have won seven in a row. Nobody on the East Coast knows about it, you know, and, and they're they're beating the best teams right now. And you guys, you were talking about it because you know sports. You were talking about uh, they did a reverse boycott at right. Oakland. They had 27,000 fans last night, night close, close to 30, uh, biggest crowd of the year in Oakland, and they all they were doing was chanting about the owner and sell the team, you know, because they're bitter. They don't want to move to Vegas. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, like, so I, I go through all of the baseball highlights – and I, I and I look at this could have been you know when I'm watching sports this could have been on Twitter, this could have been on Facebook, this could have been on uh, one of these other you know on Instagram and should be, but because you have a commissioner that doesn't get the modern day kids and how they consume, um, they they need listen I don't believe in TikTok I don't think it should be uh, a thing with it, the way it is used, but you could use that with MLB. You could use that with Instagram and these kids because you have to grow. Like, you're a baseball fan because of your childhood. Yeah. Ben's a baseball fan because of his childhood. There's not a lot of kids other than the ones that I coach that are consuming baseball. Agreed. You, you have to start, other than video games, you know, you have to start making them consume it by seeing it. And what do they see every day? They see social media. That's how they live. My 12-year-old, we're going to talk to Bill uh, Ryder coming up in a little bit, but we have young kids and their whole world is their cell phone and Snapchat. That That's what they survive on all day. If you take that away as a parent right now, it's like taking away their arm. So, I mean, mm-hmm. the, if you, we don't start doing that, um, we still fall back on SportsCenter. We still be, I'll, I'll tell you what, as a player, and I'm going back 30 years now, yep. we would go to a restaurant or rewatch our game or highlights through SportsCenter. 
just want to see, did I make it? Did I make it? Did I make it? I mean, <clears throat> that was huge back then. And we've all we've gotten away from the way they do highlights, the way that they they uh, portray you as heroic and, and prop you up. Now they want to cut everybody down. And I think that that's really hurt the, the viewership and people that even want to go to see the sport. Yeah, and it's it's just so interesting how they've transitioned Sports Center away. I, right? I mean, how do you deliver highlights in a world where everybody knows the outcome of the game and have seen all the right. highlights before they wake up at 6 a.m. to watch Sports Center? It, that was the thing is when you woke up at 6 or 7, you were watching Sports Center and you were learning the result. You had the, the, the newspaper box score, but this brought that box score to life. Before I'm even out of bed, I've seen every score on my phone. I've seen the important plays on Twitter. And sitting in front of a TV and watching a Sports Center highlight show, it, it doesn't make sense. But in the same vein, that is your marketing. That is how you're selling this stuff. That's right. And yeah, it, it's just really it's interesting. No, I th- and I think you should do a lot of live stuff. Hey, here's Stanton versus Scherzer last night. Or, yeah, let's go in? to let's it. Let's cut yeah. in. Yeah, right. let's cut in. If I don't have MLB.com, I can't I can't get that live hit. Now I watch a lot of MLB TV during games sometimes just to flick it on and see, you know, who's the regional or who's whatever. And sometimes I got the Rangers on. Sometimes Rangers on. When I worked for part of an afternoon drive, is we could any live game because they could every game. Mm-hmm. So because of satellite if you're a, a you know consumer and someone that was a member, um, you, you know you were all of a sudden we're cutting into Red Sox, Yankees, Mets, what Dodgers, and, and we would stay with it for like ten minutes because mm-hmm. we could. And I just kind of think you kind of have to be more like Netflix, more like Hulu, where you're getting this live consumption of Red your Zone. sport. entire game but i could watch 10 minutes of all of these scores you know or yeah. when they're live all of a sudden mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a cowboy fan i come i come in or or it's an alert on my phone hey by by the way cowboys are driving and turn it on right now and you might see them score yeah you know that's the way these kids live their lives mm-hmm. and we we need to get on board with that all right my bill Ryder. Uh, he was at the NBA Finals. He covers the NBA for CBS Sports, uh, has his own nationally syndicated radio show. He will join us next. And we'll talk about the NBA. Maybe we'll talk about the NFL or anything else uh, because he is a great uh, opinionated person. So Bill Ryder on the Rob Dibble Show with Adam Giardino next.